Hey guys, welcome back. In this part, we'll continue the calculator skills section of quadratic equations, and we'll start with considering projectile motion. So a projectile, you've probably heard the phrase before, or the word before, is any object that is thrown, shot, or dropped. So something can be dropped off of a ledge, off the top of a mountain, off the top of a building. Uh, bullets are tr typically, in, in formal language or formal parlance, called projectiles. Uh, that's where the name actually comes from. Projectile motion started off as the motion of a, of a bullet. And you can also throw a rock in the air or throw a ball in the air. Uh, football players, basketball players, they're all dealing with projectiles on a, daily day, on a daily basis. Projectiles always follow a parabolic path. Parabolic is something that has to do with a parabola. So something that's going to look like a quadratic equation or quadratic function is probably what the parabolic path is going to look like. And with any of these, we can ask four very reasonable questions. So if we throw something off the top of a ledge, or maybe we shoot something, uh, or we drop something off the top of a building, what was the height above ground level when the object was launched? So maybe you throw something off the top of a building. How high is the building when you throw the ball, say, off the top of a building? And the way we answer this question is we essentially are looking for the y-intercept. And because these are going to be functions of time, if we want to find the y-intercept, we typically set the input variable equal to 0. Since the input variable is going to be time, all we have to do is find where t is equal to 0. That's going to give us the initial height, or the height above the ground where the ball was launched from, or where the, the rock was thrown from. Question two, how long before the object hits the ground after launch? Here, all we're asking for is the larger x-intercept. So when you see this question, how long before the object hits the ground after launch, think that you want the larger t-value. So it's the x-intercept or just the larger time. What is the maximum height of the object? Here, we're looking for the y-coordinate of the vertex. This shouldn't seem too, too strange or too new because the maximum height of a parabola would be the y-coordinate of the vertex. After how many seconds is the object at its maximum height? That's the x-coordinate of the vertex, or the t-coordinate in this case. So let's see how we would answer these questions looking at an example. So we have this individual who is luckily in Acapulco, and she's on vacation, and she's doing cliff diving, because why not? Her height as a function of time, so height is the output variable, time is the input variable, is modeled by this function, h of t. So h will be the y value, t will be the x value. h is the output, t is the input, t is the independent variable, h is the dependent variable. And the function is given as negative 16t squared plus 16t plus 96 where t is measured in seconds and h is measured in feet. So this is a rough sketch of what it looks like. We're actually going to do a, a proper sketch of the graph after we found some things, but this is a rough sketch of what, you know, maybe the scenario looks like. Before I do these problems, I always draw a rough sketch just to see what the, the scenario actually is. So there's some cliff here. Here's Erica. She's having fun. Here's the ocean underneath. Uh, and then there's some height. I don't know what that height is, but I, I don't know how tall that cliff is. And it's probably something we're going to have to find. And Erica, being very athletic, is going to jump up and then sort of do a flip and then come back uh, into the ocean. So algebraically, we should be able to answer these questions. In the previous video, we would have answered these with a calculator. And in fact, the nitro problems ask you to do exactly that. But algebraically, as a reminder, here's how we would approach these. So if we're asked to find the height above the ground level of the cliff, so how high is she jumping off from? This is really just the y-intercept. So if we have the height function, if we plug in 0 for the input variable, so if we find h of 0, we would get negative 16 times 0 squared plus 16 times 0 plus 96. So that comes along for the ride. Now here we know that 0 squared is 0, so that's the simplification I did here. We know that 16 times 0 is 0, so that's where we got that from. And then finally 96 is just coming along. 
I'm doing one more computation here. Negative 16 times 0 gives us 0. And then finally, 0 plus 0 plus 96 yields 96. With scenario questions, I always prefer that students end with a sentence. It's only proper that we do. So we say that the cliff is 96 feet high. The units are important. They were given to us at the end of the problem. H is measured in feet. T, or the time, is measured in seconds. So anytime we find a height, we should reference the units. Anytime we find a time, we need to reference that in seconds. This will be graded on the next test or going forward. So please make sure anytime units are presented to you, you always use them in your answer. You must, must, must reference units when provided. Continuing on, how long will it take for Erica to land in the water? Here, remember from earlier, we're looking for the larger x-intercept, or in this case, the larger t-intercept, because that's our input variable. So in order to find the x-intercept or the t-intercept, we have to set the function equal to 0, and then solve for t. So if we set h of t equal to 0, we get this equation. Now here, you can solve it any fav your favorite ways. You can use the quadratic formula, although you'll see how easy it is to just factor. So you could theoretically use the quadratic formula on this problem, and you'd end up with the same answers. That being said, let's see how much nicer it is to just factor out the GCF and factor it. So here we recognize that there's a negative 16 that we can factor out of all three terms. So if we factor out the negative 16, we get t squared minus t minus 6. Pause the video at this stage, convince yourself that this computation was done correctly. And then pause the video again to confirm that this does indeed factor to this. So t squared minus t minus 6 factors the t minus 3 times t plus 2. The negative 16 GCF comes along for the ride. Now at this stage, we can invoke the zero product property. The, the zero product property for review says if one side of the equation is zero and you have products on the other side, so we have a product between negative 16 and t minus 3, and we have another product between t minus 3 and t plus 2. Whenever that's the scenario, whenever you have zeros on one side or a zero on one side and a product on the other, one of these terms must be zero. We don't know which one, but one of them has to be zero. Now, negative 16 can never be zero. That, that's impossible. We cannot force negative 16 to ever turn into zero, so we don't even have to worry about it. However, t minus 3, well, that could be zero. If, three, if t is equal to 3, then t, 3 minus 3 will give us a zero, so this can definitely be zero. Similarly, t plus 2 could be zero as well. So by the zero product property, we can set both of those binomials, review term, binomial means two terms. We can set this binomial equal to zero, add the three to the other side, and get t equals three. Or we can do the same thing here, subtract the two over to the other side, and get t equals negative two. Now, I want you to pause the video and think about what it would mean for time to be negative two seconds. So I guess the question I want you to ponder think about and then write a note about in your notes here is can the time be negative itself? This is something I'm going to be checking for in class, so please make sure that you write an answer to this question and maybe just explain why or why not. Now, we were looking for the larger t-intercept or the larger x-intercept. t equals 3 is the larger one, so 3 is obviously greater than negative 2. So we say that it takes er, it will take Erica three seconds, again, we must reference the units we were given, to land in the water. Next, we're looking for the maximum height that she will reach. This is the y-coordinate of the vertex, or the h value in this case. Now, if we're given a function, in order to find the y-coordinate, we first have to find the x-coordinate of the vertex, or in this case, the t-coordinate, because that's the input. So in order to find the t-coordinate of the vertex, we use our friendly formula, negative b over 2a. So negative of b would be negative 16 over 2 times a. a is negative 16, so we place that here. Negative 16 over negative 16 cancels out, leaving us with 1 half second. Now remember, we're looking for the maximum height, not a time. So in order to find the maximum height, we need the y-coordinate, or in this case, the h-coordinate. 
And we do that by taking one half and plugging it into the function. Oops. Just lost my screen and we're back. In, sorry, lost my train of thought. Oh yes. So here we have to plug in one half into this function. One half squared will be one fourth. One half times 16 will just be eight. The 96 comes along for the ride and the negative 16 comes along for the ride. Negative four, or sorry, negative 16 divided by four will give us a negative four plus the eight plus the 96. And if we clean up this arithmetic mess, we get 100. Now this is a height, so the units of height will be 100 feet. A sentence to explain our answer, Erica will reach a maximum height of 100 feet. Now this is curious. The cliff was already 96 feet tall. So she's jumping off of 96 feet, and when she jumps, she's not just falling straight into the ocean, she's actually going up in the air. So she goes up to a height of 100 feet, and then sort of turns around and then comes back down to, to the ocean. So keep this in the back of your mind when we go back to drawing our graph. The last part here is after how many seconds will Erica reach the maximum height? Remember, this was the x-coordinate of the vertex. And we already found this in part three above, so all we have to do is just write a sentence referencing that answer, and we can say that it will take Erica one half second, and we can reference that we found it in part three above, to reach a height of 100 feet. Now we can use all this information to come up with a reasonably accurate graph. So here we had just a rough sketch. Now we should be able to come up with something pretty uh, decent and relatively precise. So here I'm going to flip over my iPad. So this is my t-axis. This is my h-axis. Time being the x-value, h being the y-value. So this is time t equals 1, time t equals 2, t equals 3. And then this will be the height of 96 feet, and this will be 100 feet. Now you'll notice that my scale, first of all, is different for the x-coordinates or the t-coordinates, and it's different for the h-coordinates. That needs to be the case. If, if everything were equally spaced, if this distance were 1, this picture would not even fit in the screen, so this would need to be compressed. Another graphing tool or technique or trick rather is whenever you see these broken lines or this jagged edge, it means that I basically cut out some piece of the H axis to compress this, to bring it down lower. Or you can think of it as, hey, we crumpled it up so that we can fit it on this page. This is just a known graphing technique. Anytime you see these squiggle lines here or jagged sawtooth edge, it just means that some y values or h values are, are not accounted for. They're, they're missing for the benefit of, of being able to draw a picture. So we know that Erica is jumping off of here because at time zero, her height is 96 feet. She's 96 feet up in the air and she's standing on the cliff. So I'll draw her position in green. So at time t equals zero, she's right there. And now one half second later, Remember in part C, we got that the vertex was reached at one half of a second. So one half of a second would be half the distance here, so this would be one half. At that moment, she is at 100 feet. So she jumped four feet up in the air. Now we were also told in part two that it will take Erica three seconds to land in the water. So at time t equals 3, her height has to be 0. That's an x-intercept. So the height can be modeled by this graph. And this doesn't have to look very pretty. Say it doesn't have to look very pretty, but I want to make it pretty. All right, that's as good as I'm going to get it. So Erica is jumping up from this cliff, reaches a maximum height of 100 feet, so she basically jumps four feet in the air, which is pretty darn high, and then she sort of turns around and comes back down. And three seconds later, she's in the ground. So she's, she's flying for a good three seconds. That, that's some pretty nice free fall. I hope this helps. The Nitro questions ask you to basically do the same thing but using a calculator. 
So algebraically, hopefully you can see that this is pretty intense. This is a fair bit of number crunching and algebra crunching. Whereas when we get to the nitro problems, you'll be doing the same thing. You'll be talking about something that's launched in the air and it's gonna have some sort of speed. The equation of the height or the position is going to be given by, the, by this function. And then you're asked, what is the height above the ground when the object is launched? So here you would graph the equation and look for a y-intercept and you'll see that it's 58.8. And then the same thing, how long before the object hits the ground, you're looking for the larger t-intercept. So you'd just be able to zoom into a certain picture and get your answer without having to do all this factoring stuff. Which, by the way, once you start getting into decimals is not all that pleasant. So this is where a calculator really comes in to help us and, and saves us a whole bunch of time. Hopefully this helps. We'll see you in the next video.